Now, I know this is a Linux desktop focused channel, but I still find it interesting to follow what's happening with WSL, otherwise known as the Windows subsystem for Linux. And I'm pretty sure I did a video on Build 2020 talking about some of the new features coming to WSL 2. One of those features being native Linux GUI app support inside of WSL. Now, even in WSL 1 and in WSL 2 up until this point, there have been ways to do it by just running an X server and fiddling around with settings until you actually get it to work. But this requires a lot of user intervention and as you can probably imagine, isn't the most convenient way to work. But Microsoft promised seamless integration and seamless integration is what you're going to get. So this is named WSL G, which is basically what happens when you let developers name things. So this video here demonstrates how seamless the integration actually is. Basically all this person does is launches up gedit and as you can see it just works. It's got the correct window borders, everything like that, and nothing else really needs to be done. You don't have to go and start up an X server or start up a Wayland compositor. It just does it all for you. Now, Microsoft isn't coming up with a proprietary display server that only runs on Windows to make this work. They're still running a Wayland compositor, and they're still running an X server, so it's basically what you would do yourself, except add in, I guess, an extra layer of containers. So there's a diagram here that actually explains how this all works. Now, when you start up an app, it's going to be started up inside of the distro you're running inside of WSL. So Ubuntu, Debian, CentOS, other distros supported in WSL, but you're not actually generating any of the GUI interfaces inside of your WSL distro. In fact, you're not even running an X server or a Wayland compositor inside of it. All of the GUI stuff is going to be handled inside of a sub-distro. This distro is known as the WSLG system distro, which is running a copy of Microsoft's own Linux distribution, CBL Marina, which is the same distribution they use on their Microsoft Azure servers. And regardless of whether you're running an X11 app or a Wayland app, everything is going to be running through Wayland. So in the case of the X11 app, it's going to run through X Wayland into your Wayland compositor, and the Wayland app obviously is going to run directly into the compositor. Now, as for the compositor they're using, they're actually using Western. Now, you may have never heard of Western because most people who recommend Wayland say things like you should use Sway or you should use Gnome if you want a desktop environment. But what Western is, is the reference implementation for a Wayland compositor. Basically, it doesn't do anything special. It just does what Wayland is supposed to do. Also, Western already has a backend for a remote desktop protocol built into it, which basically allows the WSL virtual machine. Yes, it is a virtual machine. I'm sick of people telling me that WSL doesn't use a virtual machine, actually communicates with the Windows host to get the GUI apps actually spawning on the Windows desktop. While this isn't specifically related to graphical applications, it also comes with a Pulse Audio server that has input coming from the Windows desktop and then sends output back to the Windows desktop so you can actually make use of modern audio. While WSL already would have ULSA support, most modern graphical applications don't work nicely with ULSA if they work with ULSA at all. So having this Pulse Audio server here is basically going to be essential for any sort of audio work. Now, because this is using Wayland, it does mean there's going to be a couple of issues with a very small pool of applications, mainly the applications that don't really make sense inside of the Wayland security model. One of those applications being OBS. Now, OBS does actually have a native Wayland port at this point, so you can actually spawn the window, but to actually get screen capture support working, it completely breaks the model for Wayland security. So it's done with an external application, in this case, Pipewire, and this doesn't actually have Pipewire with it, so capturing your desktop with OBS loaded inside of WSL I don't think is going to work, and there's a couple other screen capture apps that are in the same boat, and a couple other weird things like that, but general applications should be perfectly fine. Now, you may be wondering why they went with Wayland rather than just going with an Xorg server, which we know basically just works, and they did actually have a bit of an explanation for this. So what they said is almost all applications that our users were asking to run within WSL were X11 based, which makes sense because I can't think of that many apps outside of like the GNOME suite that actually have native Wayland ports. But as the Linux desktop community was moving towards Wayland, it's been doing that for about 10 years, we felt it was important to support it. We didn't want Linux on Windows to be stuck in the past 
limited to X11 applications, and for WSLG to be a hindrance to the shift to Wayland. So by supporting Wayland, even though you may not like this, it will encourage more people to actually develop applications with Wayland in mind. From what I understand, they're basically running stock Western as well, but they did have to go and modify the remote desktop protocol backend to do, as they say, teach it new tricks. I don't know what exactly that means though. Now, the reason why they separate out the user's distro and then the distro that actually spawns all the GUI applications is actually a couple of reasons for it. One of them is so you can actually make modifications to this section without going and affecting anything that actually happens over here. And as we know, Microsoft is well known for releasing a patch that just wipes some hard drives or causes some data to be lost. Basically, it is a safeguard against that happening, plus it makes it much easier to actually make modifications to this. The other reason that the other reason for this is if you merge them together, that would require everyone currently running WSL to then go and reinstall their distro or download a massive amount of updates that changes their distro. And that could be done, but it requires doing this to every single distro in WSL rather than just doing it in one place. Honestly, I'm really surprised they took the easy route here rather than going and making their own proprietary display server that like partially supports Wayland and XOR gaps and then encouraging Linux devs to go and actually start supporting their proprietary nonsense. They just use the open standards. It's cheaper, it's less time consuming, I can't really fault Microsoft for doing this. Now, you may have noticed a problem. This is using Wayland, and a lot of people on Windows run NVIDIA cards. Now, if you know anything about Wayland and NVIDIA, you probably know that NVIDIA cards do not play nicely with Wayland, specifically with X Wayland, where nothing gets GPU accelerated. Now, NVIDIA has said the 470 version of the drivers will work better with Wayland. We don't exactly know what this means, because as they're recording this video, those drivers currently aren't out. But better support is better than nothing. But if you go and look around, you'll see that GPU acceleration is working perfectly fine, and not just with Intel and AMD cards, but also with NVIDIA cards as well. This is some robot simulation. I don't know exactly what it's doing, but it is GPU accelerated. So the GPU drivers running on WSL2 aren't the same GPU drivers you'll see on your native Linux system. These actually rely on the Windows NVIDIA drivers being there as well. So basically what WSL sees is a virtual GPU known as a vGPU inside of the documentation. And... It's better than having no support whatsoever, but it still doesn't mean you're going to have perfect Wayland support on Linux. Now, even though all of this is cool, I had no idea what the point of the whole endeavor was, because while CLI support makes a lot of sense, because there's a lot of Linux tools that you may want to have access to on your Windows system, I couldn't think of a single graphical application on Linux that doesn't already have a Windows port that I actually want to run on Windows. Maybe I'm just thinking way too consumer application, but I can't think of anything that I would really want. Most of the graphical applications that aren't on Windows aren't on Windows, so they just won't make sense on Windows. But I was sort of missing the whole point. WSL isn't directed towards just regular people using Windows, it's directed towards developers. And if you're trying to develop an app under Windows and then test it on Linux, this would actually be really, really useful. Or even if you just want to develop Linux applications, but you don't want to be running Linux as your native operating system. So the workflow could be something like you open up your code editor or IDE inside a WSL. And when you do that, it actually gives you access to your WSL files rather than just your Windows files. And then you can go and execute the code under WSL rather than having to go and test the application in some like dedicated VM or booting up a native system to do so, you have access to an audio server to test things like mic input and audio output, and you can even leverage GPU access to test 3D acceleration. Obviously, it is going to be slower, and there are some numbers in one of these blogs. I think it is this one? No, it might be the other one. There are some numbers here that show how much slower it's going to be. Partially, it's going to be slow because you're literally running two Linux distributions at the exact same time, but because you're also running a virtual GPU as well, there's also going to be issues with that.
So this is running Geek's 3D GPU test. Now do keep in mind that synthetic benchmarks always produce weird results and they might skew things more than they'd be skewed in the real world. But with an RTX 3090 running it natively under Windows, you get 540 FPS under WSLG with the virtual GPU. 350 FPS and then running it just on the CPU. They don't actually mention what CPU they're using. You get 4 FPS. So the GPU acceleration is clearly working. And then with a Surface Book Gen 3, very similar results, obviously not as drastic. So 19 FPS running it natively, virtual GPU 18, and then running on software. I imagine it's probably getting barely 1 FPS and they just put 1 FPS because they don't want to show a decimal. Obviously, if you need to do hardcore GPU accelerated work on Linux, you aren't going to be doing it through WSL. You're going to be running native Linux and getting the most performance you can get. However, if you are writing the software that does hardcore GPU accelerated work on Linux and you want to be able to test it, maybe doing this actually wouldn't be the worst idea. So all of this is a part of Microsoft's continued attempt to basically bring everything good about Linux into Windows. So whether that is just generally having access to the Unix tools on a Windows-based system or having access to a Windows package manager because package management is just a more convenient way to install stuff for a developer or being able to just test your Linux applications on Windows. All of this stuff just makes it so a Windows developer doesn't have to try out Linux. They can already get Linux inside of their current operating system. Now, I know there's going to be people complaining in the comment section, but I don't think this is a bad thing. What this means is there's going to be more developers who have access to Linux and can actually make new Linux applications. You might complain about whether they're good developers or not, but I don't think that the operating system you use really defines whether that's the case. Microsoft loves Linux. They love Linux so much, they never want you to leave Windows, and they want to bring all of Linux into it and make them one big, happy family. So I think that's pretty much everything for me. But before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Joachim, Donald, Michael, Andrew, Nathan, David, Will, Brennan, Chico, Bento, Jamie, Joseph, Mitchell, Peter, D, Stephen, Tony, Jushar, and all of my $2 supporters. If you'd like to go support my work, the links down below to my Patreon, subscribe, start, leave, pay, all that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over Tea, available basically anywhere. And then this channel is available on Odyssey and BitChute if you'd like to watch on a platform that isn't YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me. And I'm out.